We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Hello, I'm Barbara Perry, Professor of Psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego. I'm going to be talking to you today on peripartum depression and its chronobiological aspects. First, there are gender differentiated predispositions to both medical and psychiatric illness. Men are more prone to cardiovascular disease, violence, and alcoholism. Women to thyroid disease, eating disorders, and depression. Women are at increased risk for depression throughout their reproductive years, and this is occurring in all cultures and countries. The theories for why women predominate with respect to depression include genetic, psychological, social, hormonal, and circadian rhythms, and I will be focusing on hormonal and the role of circadian rhythms today. Women predominate with depression in many forms, First, a unipolar depression or recurrent depressive episodes. Uh, there's an incidence of at least two to one in females to males throughout the world. Uh, there are only two exceptions that I'm aware of. First one of uh, a study by Jules Angst in Zurich, Switzerland, where both men and women are required to register for the draft and they diagnose depression at that time. And then when they follow them up, they find that the men have just forgotten that they've had a depression but that's not been replicated. The other exception is the Amish population, and that's maybe because if a woman is depressed, she's still expected to function in the home and it doesn't show up to the elders of the community, where if a man becomes depressed, it's much more prevalent. He's not out building the barn, and there's less alcoholism in that population. With respect to bipolar illness, though there's an equal incidence in men and women, Women are more prone to depression and men to episodes of mania. Cyclical forms of depression predominate in women, including rapid cycling bipolar disorder and seasonal affective disorder or winter depression. Is the reproductive system a source of vulnerability? Evidence suggests that oral contraceptive can induce depression. It's one of the most common reasons women become depressed, mostly with the progestin contents. Uh, in Europe, they offer vitamin B6 or pyridoxine with their oral contraceptives, which helps to reduce that risk. By definition, premenstrual dysphoric disorder occurs at one physiologic time of the menstrual cycle and remits at another physiologic time. The postpartum period is the most likely time for a woman to become depressed during her lifetime. And the perimenopause also is associated with an increased risk for depression. In the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in the fifth edition, peripartum mood disorders are listed as an onset specifier for either a bipolar or a depressive episode. The onset of depression during pregnancy or in the four weeks following delivery is the onset specifier. This isn't quite clinically accurate in that although the onset of a postpartum depression can occur within the four weeks after delivery, it peaks around three to five months 
postpartum. Our European and Australian colleagues are much further advanced historically in this studying this area than we are. One of the first studies in this country was by the epidemiologist Paffenbarker, whose wife suffered a postpartum psychosis. And what you can notice if you look at the dotted line here, which is the incidence of mental illness in non-childbearing women during pregnancy, the risk is much lower. But the first month postpartum, there's a dramatic increase in the onset of mental illness. And in this study, that risk is maintained for six months following delivery compared with pregnancy. This parallels a a much larger study by Kendall out of Edinburgh of 10,000 patients, which was a replication of a previous 10,000 patient study. And again, whether it's all admissions or psychosis admissions, During pregnancy, the rate is very low, but right after a delivery within the first month, there's a peak. And in this study, that risk remains elevated compared with pregnancy for up to two years postpartum. There are several different types of mood syndromes postpartum. We break it down into three different categories. Now, the English, who are more nosologists, have at least five categories. So the Americans tend to be more lumpers than splitters. Um, But maternity blues is not really considered a disorder. It occurs in 50 to 80% of women. It usually doesn't start until the third day postpartum. So nowadays when women are discharged from the hospital by the third postpartum day, they used to be there for a week, um, the obstetricians don't see it. And it's characterized by rapid shifts in mood of crying, irritability, and euphoria. In contrast, postpartum depression is a much more severe depression characterized by what we call melancholia. 10 to 15% of women are at risk for it. 80% occur within the first six weeks, and the duration is generally six to nine months, and also characterized by sleep disturbance even when the child is sleeping. Postpartum psychosis is the most severe form, occurs in about one in a thousand women has an acute onset within the first two weeks postpartum. If treated early, it can have a good prognosis, lasting two to three months. 90% of psychoses are mood disorders, 40% present with mania, and it's characterized by much delirium and confusion. Uh, The distinguishing features of a postpartum mood disorder compared to a non-postpartum mood disorder include a younger age at onset, increased frequency of episodes, decreased psychomotor activity, increased confusion, increased family history of a mood disorder, and increased incidence of depressive relapse in menopause. The risk factors for postpartum mood disorders include being primiparous, a history of postpartum mood disorder, a personal or family history of mood disorder, older age, and postpartum hypothyroidism. There's a high recurrence of postpartum mood disorders, so it's not something that can be ignored. In postpartum psychosis, one in five have a subsequent postpartum psychosis. One in three have subsequent postpartum depression. With regard to postpartum depression, there's a 50% chance of recurrence in a third of pregnancies. And for non-postpartum mood disorders, a 35 to approximately 45% rate of recurrence. Now, with regard respect to um, the circadian rhythm basis for these uh, mood disorders, estradiol and progesterone change dramatically during pregnancy and drop precipitously postpartum. Estradiol and progesterone regulate circadian rhythms of melatonin and sleep. Normally, melatonin and sleep are synchronized so that melatonin goes up right before sleep, a couple hours before sleep peaks during the mid-sleep time, and then comes back down in the morning. But with the change in reproductive hormones, melatonin can be shifted later with respect to sleep, or it can be shifted earlier with respect to sleep. And likewise, sleep time can become desynchronized with respect to melatonin. The sleep can be shifted later, or it can be shifted earlier. When we studied melatonin rhythms, which is the best measure of circadian rhythms in humans. In plasma, you can see the normal 
and the yellow rhythm of melatonin. But in the depressed patients, that melatonin rhythm is lower and shifted earlier. Melatonin is an important contributor to synchronizing other rhythms in the body. And for those women who have a personal history of depression, that rhythm is shifted earlier. And the more depressive episodes a woman has had, the earlier her melatonin offset time is. So it's not just a fleeting abnormality. In contrast, postpartum women, in contrast to the pregnant depressed women and normal controls, have higher levels of melatonin, particularly in the early morning hours that are shifted later or phase delayed. And across pregnancy, in the left panel, as estradiol and progesterone increase dramatically during pregnancy, the melatonin levels increase in normal controls. But in the depressed pregnant women, they're as though their melatonin isn't getting that signal to increase. So there's less melatonin rise across pregnancy, impairing the ability of melatonin to synchronize other rhythms. And in postpartum, Normally, as the estradiol and progesterone levels decrease, then the uh, melatonin levels tend to decrease in the normal controls, but that signal doesn't seem to be communicated in the depressed patients, so their melatonin levels continue to rise. The treatment of peripartum depression. Uh, there are multiple treatments. Uh, I don't have time to review each of these treatments, but I wanna make the point that it's much more serious for a woman not to be treated for depression, either during pregnancy or postpartum. Um, but that has adverse consequences on both the fetus and the developing infant and can ca cause emotional and neurocognitive development uh, delays and problems and now been studied for up to at least 17 years uh, after delivery. So none of these agents used to treat peripartum depression have serious teratologic risks. So again, it's much better to treat than not to treat. But they do have side effects. And so we've been looking into examining shifting sleep and light schedules to resynchronize abnormal circadian rhythms. And the idea is that in a normal happy camper on the top panel, the sleep and the circadian clock as measured by melatonin is in phase. Sometimes the clock can be delayed Progesterone tends to delay circadian rhythms. So we treat that with giving bright morning light, which can correct that disturbance. If the sleep is advanced, then we delay sleep to correct that disturbance. If the circadian clock is advanced, then we can give evening light, bright light, which delays circadian rhythms to correct. And if the sleep is delayed, then we advance sleep to correct the disturbance. Now, one of life's great paradoxes is that if you take a depressed patient and you keep them up all night, majority of them are better the next day. That was discovered in Europe where patients with bipolar illness, the nurses noticed before they switched from a depression into a mania, they were up all night. So if they took a depressed patient and kept them all, up all night, they were better the next day. The problem was they would often relapse as soon as they went back to sleep, even for a few minutes of rapid eye movement or REM sleep. Subsequent studies have shown you don't need to be up the whole night, that only half the night is required to convert a depressed patient or treat them with a half a night of sleep restriction. So a majority of depressed patients do respond to what we call, rather than sleep deprivation, wake therapy. Uh, the effects may occur in one day uh, some, but not all, patients may relapse with when they go back to sleep. And some, but not all, studies suggest that the wake therapy in the second, but not the first half of the night might be effective, but that may depend on someone's underlying circadian rhythms. So we wanted to try this treatment in peripartum depression. Uh, sleep disturbance characterized pregnancy and postpartum depression, even when the child is sleeping postpartum. I don't have time to present the evidence of sleep disturbances at this time. But there is concern, as mentioned, with using pharmacological interventions because of potential effects on the fetus and infant. And critically timed wake therapy may offer potential benefit within one day. 
how this works. Uh, we think that this may realign sleep in the circadian cycle. It may suppress rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. All antidepressants virtually suppress REM sleep. And if you just suppress REM sleep, you get antidepressant effects in the same time it takes an antidepressant to work, which is several weeks. It also may increase what we call the homeostatic drive. The longer you've been awake, the more likely you're to go to sleep and it improve your sleep quality. And these wake therapy interventions also change, make changes in the, the neuroendocrine system, particularly the thyroid system. So we examined, uh, took pregnant depressed women and postpartum depressed women, and we, they underwent a night of either late wake therapy where they're awake in the second part of the night and they sleep in the first part of the night from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m., or early wake therapy where they are awake in the early part of the night and they sleep in the second part of the night from 3 to 7, 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. And we found that in the pregnant women, they depressed women, they responded better to the early night wake therapy, whereas the postpartum women responded better to the late wake therapy. And that may be because it's correcting the circadian rhythm abnormality. In pregnancy, the rhythms are shifted earlier, so we delay sleep. In postpartum depressed women, the rhythms are shifted later, so we advance uh, and restrict sleep. So for the clinical bottom line for pregnancy depression, one night of early night wake therapy, you wake until 3 a.m. and sleep until 7 a.m. For postpartum depression, you have one night of late night wake therapy where you sleep, go to sleep at 9 p.m. and wake at 1 a.m. We avoid, encourage avoiding naps and if ne needed, repeat it in uh, one week. Uh, but some of these interventions have worked up to six months afterwards. Now, to address the issue that after wake therapy, some patients may relapse, one way of preventing that relapse is adding light therapy. And so using the combination seems uh, mutually advantageous. Wake therapy will hasten and potentiate the effects of light therapy, which otherwise may take like five weeks to exert its significant uh, antidepressant effects. And then light therapy prevents the relapse that may occur uh, after wake therapy. And phase advancing or shifting earlier versus phase delaying, shifting later, the wake and light interventions help to realign disturbed melatonin and sleep circadian rhythms. So there are more potent effects of this combined therapy. The conceptual model is that at baseline in pregnant women, the circadian rhythms are shifted earlier or phase advanced with respect to sleep. So we delay sleep and we give evening light, which helps to delay circadian rhythms. And this correction of the sleep and circadian rhythm dysfunction improves and we get an improved mood and sleep function. In contrast, in postpartum depressed patients, um, the melatonin rhythms are phase delayed or shifted later with respect to sleep. So we advance sleep in a phase advance intervention and give morning bright light, which advances circadian rhythms. And it says, as a result, we get an improved function in mood and sleep as a result of phase advancing melatonin rhythms relative to sleep. And in fact, this is what we observed in pregnant women. They had a positive response to the early wake therapy plus the PM evening bright white light. And in contrast, the postpartum depressed patients uh, did better with late wake therapy and morning bright white light. So the treatment implications for combining sleep and light therapy in depressed women, that when the circadian rhythms of melatonin are phase delayed or shifted later, and we have found this in premenstrual depression, postpartum depression, and menopausal depression, we advance and restrict sleep and give morning bright white light. With the phase advanced melatonin rhythms that are shifted earlier, like in pregnancy, we delay and restrict sleep and give evening bright white light. And we can get an effect with one day and then maintain that effect. Uh, since you make the diagnosis of depression over two weeks, we get the effect within one to two weeks. And the improved mood correlates with the change in melatonin. So these treatments may have positive benefits. Your mother just wants to let you know that she's finally over her postpartum depression. 
This is nothing new. As Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, truly the light is good and is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. If we ever intend to take over the world, one thing we'll have to do is synchronize our biological clocks. And I wanted to emphasize not just women suffer postpartum psychosis. This is a sketch of Theseus uh, Tass. He suffered a postpartum psychosis after the birth of his third child and killed his wife and all three children. He went to the ruler Theseus and to make penance, he was given these tasks of Hercules. Thank you. This work couldn't have been done without my valuable laboratory team. Alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much, as Helen Keller said. Thank you. It's great to see everyone. And today I'm going to talk about addiction and loss of control. I'm going to talk about addiction from a different perspective than most people would think of addiction in the sense that I'm going to talk about the misery of addiction. And that brings me to hyperkatephia, which I will define later, negative reinforcement, and the dark side of addiction. So one of the things I like to always do is, is just talk about the scope of the problem. And while most of you are familiar with the fact that we are in an opioid epidemic and that we uh, have you know, an epidemic and, of uh, overdoses on opioid drugs, and, but what you don't realize is that we're always in, in a situation with a problem with alcohol. And so if you look at, uh, at this table, you can see the opioid use disorder. There are 2 million individuals with an opioid use disorder. There are actually 14 million people with an alcohol use disorder. If you go down to emergency department visits, you see the same uh, difference in that the, the alcohol is a much larger problem overall in our society. And so I always say that alcohol is the addiction that um, everybody knows about, but no one wants to talk about. In fact, we lose about 90,000 people a year to alcohol use disorder. And, and actually half of liver disease in the United States now is caused by alcohol. So what I'm gonna talk about is outlined in the following slide. I'm gonna talk about loss of control and compulsivity and addiction. Uh, and, and in that context, the neurocircuitry of incentive salience, pathological habits, the withdrawal negative affect, and executive function deficits in addiction. I'm going to talk about the dark side of addiction and the conceptual framework involved, which includes opponent process, hyperkatephia, and negative reinforcement. I will talk about neuroplasticity in the brain negative emotional circuits um, and, how, and loss of reward neurotransmitters and the gain of stress neurotransmitters. And finally, I'm going to talk about a, uh, briefly the overlap in the brain negative emotion and pain neurocircuits and the implications for the role of addiction in deaths of despair and the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So some basic definitions. What is addiction? Well, it's defined as chronically relapsing disorder that is characterized by a compulsion to seek and take drug or stimulus, loss of control and limiting intake, an emergence of a negative emotional state, dysphoria, anxiety, irritability, when access to the drug or stimulus is prevented. And here we define this as the dark side of addiction. And this latter, Part of the definition is what I call the KUB add-on. So everyone will agree with the first parts about compulsion to seek and take the drug and loss of control and limiting intake, but the negative emotional state is what I'm going to focus on in this talk. I want to uh, mention two other terms, impulsivity. That is behavior that is impulsive, from the Latin impulsive, tending to impel or drive onward, and it's defined as an action that is instigated suddenly without forethought of potential consequences. Compulsivity, in contrast, is behavior that is compulsive, from the Latin word compulse, driven or forced, and is defined as an action that results from or is related to an irresistible urge, whereby irresistibility can be oper operationalized as behavior that persists despite aversive or incorrect outcomes. So this brings me to the conceptual framework for the neurobiological basis driving substance use disorders. And, and the first point of, of my outline. So what I'm arguing is that there are, and this is a heuristic framework that's evolved over the years from clinical studies, imaging studies, social psychology, and preclinical studies. And so I'm gonna argue there are three stages. There's the binge intoxication stage, the withdrawal negative affect stage, and the preoccupation anticipation stage. For those of you who are not neuroanatomically inclined, um, these stages are color-coded with bits of the brain and circuits in the brain that I'll discuss in a second. 
So the binge intoxication stage involves incentive salience and pathological habits, and, and is, the substrate is largely basal ganglia, which is the blue structures there. The withdrawal negative affect stage refers to the domain of reward deficit and stress surfeit, or increased stress, and it's illustrated by the red circuits, which involve the extended amygdala. And the preoccupation anticipation stage um, is, a, is basically the domain of dysfunction there is executive function deficits and largely mediated by frontal cortex, which is in green here, and older cortex like hippocampus and insula. So just to drill down a little bit, we know that the neural circuits in the binge intoxication stage involve the basal ganglia. They involve release of dopamine and opioid peptides in the ventral part of the basal ganglia. We also know that this drives incentive salience whereby stimuli that have been previously paired with the release of these reward transmitters actually then gain reinforcing value and motivational value. And we also know that habits, pathological habits, are formed in this stage of the addiction cycle, mediated by dorsal parts, the, the, what's called DS there, dorsal striatum of the basal ganglia. Um, the neural circuits of the withdrawal negative affect stage uh, are focused on the structures um, with the core element, the central nucleus, the amygdala, labeled CEA here. Many of you have heard of the amygdala. The amygdala is involved in fight or flight and stress-like responses. This stage of the addiction cycle is characterized by negative affect, dysphoria, anxiety, irritability, and malaise. Um, and key neurochemical systems are loss of dopamine and opioid peptide function, largely in the nucleus accumbens, but gain of, neuro, of stress neurotransmitters, CRF, dynorphin, norepinephrine, vasopressin, hypocretin, neuroimmune factors um, in the extended amygdala. And then the neural circuits of the preoccupation anticipation craving stage involve largely frontal cortex. You can see the functional domains here, but one of the biggest deficits associated with frontal cortex dysfunction is uh, executive dysfunction, loss, uh, increased impulsivity, increased compulsivity, sleep disturbances, impaired decision making. Two neurotransmitters that are critically involved are glutamate and GABA, which project back and control the basal ganglia and the extended amygdala, the two uh, subcortical structures involved in motivated behavior, as we've just seen. So to make it a, a very clear, what we're talking about are three stages where there's initially a rewarding and pleasurable effect and incentive salience associated with the drug. As this shows tolerance and starts to fade in motivational significance, a second form of motivation kicks in, which is relief. Or the, or the removal of a negative emotional state. And this, even when, when drug seeking um, has, has stopped for loss of drug or, or, uh, or, or attempts to uh, stop taking drug, you end up with what is known as protective abstinence, where some of these symptoms associated with the, with the uh, withdrawal negative affect stage extend for weeks and sometimes months. So loss of control, very simply, the title of this talk, and compulsivity in addiction derives from three elements, uh, development of incentive salience and pathological habits for drugs, dysregulation of your reward system, development of reward deficits and sensitization of the stress neurocircuits during the withdrawal negative affect stage, and compromised executive functions. And all of these domains and circuits interact to produce the compulsive drug-seeking behavior that we associate with a very severe alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, stimulant use disorder. So now I want to drill down a little bit on what I call the dark side of addiction. This is The Absence Drinker by Pablo Picasso. Um, there were many during uh, of these paintings during the period between uh, the 1800s and the 1900s. And, and most of the uh, painters describe individuals drinking this very potent drink, which contained not only alcohol, but also uh, a stimulant, uh, thujone, which is a, a cage convulsant, and related a little bit to strychnine. And so every one of these paintings during this period, no one in any of these paintings that I've observed is ever smiling. They actually look fairly glum, and that's one of the reasons why I really like this painting, and I use it to introduce the dark side of addiction. 
So I want to take on another conceptual framework here, and that is a, a concept that was evolved um, many years ago and championed by Richard Solomon at the University of Pennsylvania. And he basically had a, a theory that there was a hedonic adaptation, an attempt by the brain and the body to return to a normal uh, homeostatic hedonic state. And so his argument, as you can see in the left-hand side here, is that the A process was getting high on a drug, and he was using uh, opioids as an illustration. But when the opioid wore off, there was a B process or a, a negative emotional state that followed. But when you became dependent, you lost the A state, which we would call tolerance, and you gained the B state, which you would call withdrawal. But some have hypothesized that, in fact, the B state is so large that it's actually subtracting out the former A state. Um, now, most of you don't stay up at night trying to understand how opponent process uh, evolves and what causes the B straight, but I've been uh, really obsessed with this over, over the last 20 years. And so uh, to describe the state, which I call a hypersensitive negative emotional state, I made up a new word, which I call hyperkatifia. It's defined as the increased intensity of negative emotional motivational symptoms and signs observed during withdrawal from abused drugs. It's derived from the Greek word katifia for dejection, sadness, or negative emotional state. Hyperkatifia is hypothesized to represent elements such as dysphoria, irritability, alexithymia, or simply symptoms often described as, described as ill at ease, uncomfortable within one's own skin, or simply not hedonically normal. Symptoms historically difficult to define. And this negative emotional state, this hyperkatifia, drives a second source of reinforcement in drug addiction and in loss of control in drug addiction. And I, um, this is a, a well-known uh, neuropsychological term, negative reinforcement, but often not well understood. And it's actually defined as the process by which removal of an aversive stimulus, a negative emotional state of drug withdrawal, increases the probability of a response, dependence-induced drug taking. Negative reinforcement is not punishment. Negative reinforcement is the relief from an aversive stimulus, increasing the probability of a response. And so my argument is that the neurochemical basis of opponent process involves a reward deficit and stress surfeit and, and inhibition of the reward circuits, as illustrated here with the decrease in dopamine and opioid peptides, but a, an increase or a driving of the brain stress systems that we use for fight or flight, notably CRF, dynorphin, norepinephrine, vasopressin, hypocretin, and neuroimmune function. And on this slide now, I have added in green the apparent tolerance that I argue is actually uh, in, in effect hyperkatifia, which is contributing not only to withdrawal when the drug is worn off, but also to tolerance. So finally, I want to talk uh, about the interaction of hyperkatifia with the pain of addiction. And uh, Martha Woodruff um, kindly agreed to participate in a, in a uh, congressional briefing we had at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism for congressional staff. And what she her talk was so powerful that I asked her whether I could get a quote, and this is what she said. I grew up professionally focused and personally adrift. There's a long history in my family of depression, and my childhood home was dominated by my mother's mental illness that was not recognized, let alone treated. Sometime in my mid-30s, I started using alcohol to provide relief from the pain of childhood damage and organic depression. Bourbon was the only thing that would make the loop tape of despair in my head pipe down. Martha Woodruff is a, a former public radio journalist, and she terms herself a late-blooming novelist. And so I just want to point out a couple of two data points. One is in humans. This is a study in humans showing that uh, opioid withdrawal produces hyperalgesia in heroin-dependent individuals. And in fact, hyperkatifia is the negative emotional state of withdrawal is also accompanied by hyperalgesia, which is increased pain uh, during withdrawal. And these are individuals who were uh, maintained on, on methadone, and then they were abstinent for either 24 hours, the, the orange bars, or uh, for 30 months, the yellow bars. And they tested them with a, basically a, the equivalent of a blood pressure measurement device, 
And what you can see is that the pain was exaggerated in the individuals during acute withdrawal, but also in yellow in the X users. And it lasted into protracted MS for over 30, uh, up to 30 months. And we can replicate that in animal models. And just to give you one piece of data, these are data from our own, my own laboratory when I was at the Scripps Research Institute. But if you look at uh, these data, we, um, we allowed animals unlimited access to heroin in the yellow, and other animals had, uh, were treated with a small molecule CRF antagonist known as MPZP. And this MPZP blocked the development of heroin escalation. So blocking the negative emotional state the, the negative stress state associated with um, chronic self-administration of heroin actually blocked the escalation and in intake, as you can see in the blue circles. But at the same time, we were able to show that MPCB blocked the hyperalgesia associated with opiate withdrawal. So there's a parallel here between the blockade of the motivational effects in driving compulsive drug seeking and the pain associated with withdrawal. And so the argument is that we know a lot about the pain pathways. The classic pain pathway is, is the spinal thalamic tract, and you can, you can see uh, pain information going up from the dorsal root ganglia to the periaqueductal gray to the hypothalamus um, to the thalamus to the, to the somatosensory cortex and eventually getting down to the emotional system of the amygdala, the fight-or-flight system. But if you look at the pink, here you can actually see there's another kind of pain pathway which has been hypothesized to be an emotional pain pathway that goes directly to the parabrachial nucleus up to the amygdala. And if you overlap my extended amygdala from addiction with the pain pathways, you see that the, the place where they intersect uh, dramatically is in the central nucleus of the amygdala. And so um, my argument is that there is a change in hedonic set point that evolves over the development of addiction. And yes, we attempt to bring our hedonic system back into homeostasis, but in fact we fail, and we, the this threshold for, for feeling normal, and hedonically normal, drifts lower and lower. It's pulled down by many other factors besides drug taking, but excessive drug taking is one of the weights on this uh, allostatic change. And, and so there's an abnormal set point that's set up and we're not returning to the normal set point. And as a result, we're vulnerable to further pathology. And so you can look here and see that genetic and epigenetic genetic factors, childhood trauma, psychiatric comorbidity, all intersect, interface with excessive drinking to produce this allostatic change in hedonic set point. Another way of looking at this is a recent article that we wrote for the American Journal of Psychiatry um, where we wanted to address the issue of how environmental changes associated with the pandemic, notably the physical distancing, which is causing, of course, social distancing, is impacting on individuals who are suffering from addiction or vulnerable to, to addiction. And our argument is that the hyperkatifia associated with the withdrawal negative affect stage um, is not only affected by these factors that I've already talked about, but may also be affected by the, the social isolation that are caused necessarily by the physical isolation of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in conclusion, what I've said today is that there's loss of control in drug addiction and it represents a dysregulation of its center of salience, pathological habits, reward stress, and executive function systems, corresponding to dysregulation of neurocircuitry within focal points of the basal ganglia, the extended amygdala, and prefrontal cortex, respectively. Individuals with addiction are miserable and suffer a hypersensitive negative emotional state during acute and protracted withdrawal, a state termed hyperkatifia, loss of control, in the dark side of addiction involves hyperkatifia driven negative reinforcement via a loss of function in reward circuitry and a gain of function in stress neurocircuitry in the extended amygdala. Withdrawal from drugs of abuse cause pain, both physical and emotional pain, significant overlap in the engagement of brain circuits mediating negative emotional states, hyperkatifia, and pain may be hypothesized to explain the role of alcohol and opioids in deaths of despair 
and the effects of social isolation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Tom Chordosh. It's a pleasure to be part of this CARTA Symposium on Altered States of Mind. My title is Imagination and Embodiment in Practices of Sacred Sonorous Being. And I'm going to begin with a passage from the poet William Blake's Marriage of Heaven and Hell. The ancient poets animated all sensible objects with gods or geniuses, calling them by the names and adorning them with the properties of woods, rivers, mountains, lakes, cities, nations, and whatever their enlarged and numerous senses could perceive. And particularly, they studied the genius of each city and country, placing it under its mental deity till a system was formed, which some took advantage of and enslaved the vulgar by attempting to realize or abstract the mental deities from their objects. Thus began priesthood choosing forms of worship from poetic tales, and at length they pronounced that the gods had ordered such things. Thus men forgot that all deities reside in the human breast. This passage addresses my theme of the role of religious practices in defining what it is to be human. Blake offers an evolutionary, or at least parahistorical argument that the priest is a debased and de degenerate version of the poet, operating through abstraction of mental deities from their objects, rather than through the poet's enlarged and numerous senses, and thereby serving enslavement and oppression rather than liberation and imagination. Imagination is a fundamental human process, to borrow a phrase from Janice Jenkins. Can we then say that imagining is an altered state of consciousness? Or is it the default state of consciousness that is the norm and defines us as human? To begin answering this question, it's useful to identify the opposite of imagination. And I wanna say that it is taking for granted. In Blake's terms, this taking for granted is not merely a description of everyday quotidian life. It is a forgetting that all deities reside in the human breast. Imagining is not simply a matter of mental imagery nor even a matter of multi-sensory imagery. I want us to recognize imagination as deeply embodied, such that the polarity of imagining and taking for granted is parallel to the polarity of movement and stasis. All movement is grounded in imagination, not only as a form of intentionality or tending toward the world, but insofar as it is that it invariably has a kind of style. And style is the imaginative possibility always present in movement. To take this one step further, movement defines life because the absolute absence of movement is death. I want to introduce the idea of sound as a feature of embodiment, movement, and imagination. Sound exists in polarity with silence, whether it is the silence of solitude or the silence of censorship but I wanna leave silence to the side in order to engage sound in religious practice. Indeed, in a comparison of two religious practices engaging the human voice in song. I'm going to make a lot of the fact that as bodily beings, we both hear and produce sound and ask us to imagine that sound is one of our enlarged and numerous senses. In sum, I want to offer a reflection on the religious implications of our sonorous being, a phrase from the philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty, which is highly resonant to understanding the contribution of imagination as a bodily process of defining our humanity. Let me begin by quoting the passage that inspires this reflection from Merleau-Ponty's 1968 essay, The Intertwining, the Chiasm, in which he introduces the idea of humans as sonorous beings. Like crystal, like metal, and many other substances, I am a sonorous being, but I hear my own vibration from within. As Malraux said, I hear myself with my throat. In this, as he also has said, I am incomparable. My voice is bound to the mass of my own life, as is the voice of no one else. But if I am close enough to the other who speaks to hear his breath and feel his effervescence and his fatigue, 
I almost witness in him as in myself, the awesome birth of vociferation. There was a reflexivity of the movements of phonation and of hearing. They have their sonorous inscription. The vociferations have in me their motor echo. This new reversibility and the emergence of the flesh as expression are the point of insertion of speaking and thinking in the world of silence. The first sentence of this passage evokes the materiality of our bodies as substance. The unexpected comparison of our living materiality to inanimate crystal or metal invokes an alterity or otherness in our embodied being that will become consequential in my argument with respect to the sacred. However, ours is a sonority that not only rings or pings when it's struck, but is intentional in producing its own sound, sentient in perceiving that sound, and reflexive about both the sound and its source as uniquely bound to the mass of my own life. This sonorous being is intersubjective insofar as we can relate to the voice, breath, effervescence, and fatigue of another human, a fellow sonorous being. It is a function of what Merleau-Ponty refers to as the flesh, by which he means our sentient materiality. His use of words like movements, emergence, and insertion suggest the existential status of speaking and thinking in the world of silence. Merleau-Ponty's understanding of the sonorous being of our embodied fleshly existence can give us insight into the imaginative embodied generation of sacred power if we take it up in the context of concrete examples. Accordingly, I'll briefly introduce two ethnographic phenomena that extend the extent existential meaning of our sonorous being to the dimension of the sacred. These are the religious practices of Pentecostal charismatic singing in tongues and Native American church peyote songs. Pentecostalism is a diverse global movement within Christianity. It is characterized by the ritual performance of charisms or gifts of the spirit, prominent among which is the practice of glossolalia or speaking in tongues. Although in some forms of Pentecostalism, speaking in tongues occurs as a spontaneous vocalization in a state of trance, among many charismatics, speaking in tongues is a conscious and intentional act. Most often those who speak in tongues are praying in tongues and thus communicating with God. Specifically, praying in tongues is a form of praise to God with the understanding that vernacular language is vastly inadequate to express the magnitude of praise of which the deity is worthy. The gift of tongues can be used in private prayer, but has particular performative impact when a group or a large assembly is praying in tongues together. This impact is amplified when praying in tongues becomes singing in tongues. In a large assembly, the mass of vocalization provides a background drone that modulates around a particular tone and with an improvised melodic contour that among Catholic charismatics is, a, is reminiscent of a Gregorian chant. There are no set melodies since as a gift of the spirit, tongues are presumed to be improvised, spontaneous and inspired. There's typically no instrumental accompaniment of singing in tongues, but frequently a gestural accompaniment in the prayer posture of palms open and arms spread or raised, and occasionally a percussive element added by the clapping of hands. Allow me to give you a simulation, a brief, respectful imitation of singing in tongues. Native American pietism is a pan-Indian religion, many ritual features of which are derived from Plains Indian cultural patterns. Ritual practice is centered on prayerful consumption of the hallucinogenic cactus, Lophophora williamsi, which contains significant amounts of the psychoactive al alkaloids, prominently including mescaline. The peyote is in effect a sacrament, medicine, spirit, and a source of insight and illumination for participants. Peyote songs are a prominent feature of the Native American church. Like singing in tongues, peyote songs are a form of prayer understood to be inspired by the peyote spirit and to facilitate connection to the divine. They may be sung in private, but when performed in a peyote meeting are solo performances. 
These prayer meetings typically take place in a flamed Indian style teepee and are all night events that last from sundown to sunrise the following morning. In the course of the meeting, peyote medicine is passed round several times and participants take turns praying, singing, and encouraging a patient whose troubles are often the reason for which the meeting is being held. Each song has a distinct melody and lyrics which are typically repeated four times with only minor variation and improvisation. Individuals may have created more than one song and may learn songs from others. The singer usually self accompanies with a ceremonial water drum or rattle. In contrast to the flowing wave like quality of singing in tongues, the percussion amplifies the song's effect with a pronounced ryth rhythmic element. Again, allow me to give you a simulation, a brief, respectful imitation of a fragment of a peyote song. The critical feature that these forms of sacred song have in common is that they have no semantic component such that all their meaning is carried in the sounds as such. There are no words. In peyote songs and singing in tongues, there are recognizable phonemes and morphemes, syllables and even syntax, but no semantic or lexical elements. Close phonetic and morphological analysis show that there are recognizable patterns among individuals and groups that pray together, and occasionally a person will report being gifted with more than one prayer language or more than one peyote song. Yet in the absence of semantic meaning, these forms are entirely about the corporeal being of sound. There is meaning, but the meaning exists whole cloth with no possibility of parsing into units. It is a seamless fabric of resonant praise for singing in tongues and a unitary sonorous embrace of the medicine's power in peyote songs. In this way, the practices presuppose a distinct state of consciousness, both in the absence of a semantic content and in the presence of the sacred. Merleau-Ponty makes two points about vocalization in a way that suggests there is something about the embodiment we have in common as human beings that forms the basis for experience of the sacred across these culturally distinct forms of ritual song. First, he says, I do not hear myself as I hear others. The sonorous existence of my voice is for me, as it were, poorly exhibited. I have rather an echo of its articulated existence. It vibrates through my head rather than outside. I am always on the same side of my body. It presents itself to me in one invariable perspective. I hear myself from both within and from without. I experience, and as often as I wish, the transition and the metamorphosis of the one experience into the other. And it is only as though the hinge between them, solid, unshakable, remained irremediably hidden from me. The existence of this hinge evokes the theme of reversibility so prominent in what Merleau-Ponty has to teach us about embodiment. There is the reversibility of my voice uttered and my voice heard. There is also a deeper reversibility of my voice articulated and my voice as I feel it from within myself. Second, when it comes to spoken language, Merleau-Ponty says, to understand a phrase is nothing else than to fully welcome it in its sonorous being, or as we put it so well, to hear what it says. The meaning is not on the phrase like the butter on the bread, like a second layer of psychic reality spread over the sound. It is the totality of what is said, the integral of all the differentiations of the verbal chain. It is given with the words for those who have ears to hear. Merleau-Ponty's point is that meaning is always embedded in the sound of speech and is not something added to it. The absence of semantic meaning in the sacred singing we have considered does not render the vocalization inconsequential or uninterested uninteresting. Instead, it points to the magnificence of sonorous being in and for itself. Indeed, the phenomenology of speaking includes far more than semantic and lexical meaning. The feeling of vocalization in our mouth and our characteristic vocal posture, 
the corporal resonance of the sound, the echo and acoustic variation in our audition, the presence of others in the modes of intimacy or performance, communication through tone of voice and the modulation between silence intervening in speech or speech in silence. These features are all present simultaneously with and providing color and flavor to semantic meaning before it enters dialogue, discourse, or narrative. The phenomenological immediacy of sonorous being is evident if we allow ourselves to reimagine vocalization, speech, and song as bodily secretions, material emanations of sonorous being. The absence of semantic meaning in peyote songs and singing in tongues amplifies these phenomenological features and their reversibility. The reversibility of the voiced and the heard and the different ways they feel or resonate not only draws back the curtain on alterity or otherness, but instantiates alterity as an immediate bodily experience. The religious and ritual setting consecrates the natural act of vocalization as an imaginative act, such that if it is possible, as is the case in both the Catholic Charismatic Renewal and the Native American Church, to experience word as power, it also becomes possible to experience voice as power. What I want to suggest in conclusion is that these sacred songs derive their performative efficacy, their power, by tapping into the embodied alterity that grounds the sacred in a particular way. Being able to move autonomously is the definition of animate life. But Merleau-Ponty observes that there are certain kinds of movements that go nowhere. Among these are, in his words, especially those strange movements of the throat and mouth that form the cry and the voice. Those movements end in sounds, and I hear them. The paradox of movement that goes nowhere provides a clue to another kind of reversibility, that between imminence and transcendence. To be precise, in peyote songs and singing in tongues, the sacred emanates from the singer's body. But in both cases, the songs and tongues are also a gift from a higher power. In both cases, the act of singing is a reaching beyond and has a trajectory toward the divine. But it is also irrevocably lodged in the chest, throat, and tongue as movement that goes nowhere. In the end, engendering this reversibility of the transcendent and imminent in concrete experience is the significance of peyote songs and singing in tongues and what they have most in common in addressing the imaginative force of sonorous being in defining our humanity. Thanks for listening.